All right, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is it's so wonderful to be here for the virtual reception for revisiting the family album, Stories That Bind Us, um, and to hear uh, artists talk about their work. Um, the way tonight is going to go is that um, um, I'll say a few words um, about the, you know how the show started and all of that. Um, and then Aline Smithson will talk about um, the show and, and uh, some of the work in it. Um, and then um, the uh, the director and the jurors award uh, winners will each have 10 minutes to talk about their work. Um, and then the honorable mentions will all have five minutes to talk about their work. So you'll be hearing from the artists more about the series um, and and then once the evening, um, when once the, all, our, all the artists have had a chance to talk about their work, um, we will open it up for questions, comments. Um, you know, if the artists want to see similarities or want to talk about different things, um, that's also a time when people that are in the show that are attending but didn't get to talk about their work. If you're, there's things that you wanted to talk about in the exhibition that you noticed, um, it's a casual night and it's really just about celebrating this great work in this exhibition. Um, and so, and then, and then we will close at that at the end. We will also um, be record. We're recording this now, and it will be on our YouTube channel afterwards. And we will send that link to everyone that signed up for the talk. Um, so, um, Natalie, if you could make sure that to um, mute people that aren't muted, um, that would be great. Thanks. So, um, I'm Hamida. Uh, Glasgow. I'm the director um, and curator of the Center for Fine Art Photography. Um, and again, just really excited to be here with everyone tonight. Um, Aline Smithson and I, um, a while back, we're talking about, you know, what what is what is a current theme that people are making really interesting work about that we want to see more of, that we want to highlight. Um, and Aline actually came up with this right or maybe we sort of smithed it together we i but i think you came up with the title um and i thought yeah that's really interesting because so many people are working around issues of family of what a found me album is it's also very close to um you know Aline's work and and the way in which she's um you know some of her um later series are talking about what happens when this digital, um, you know, when when the digital images don't get printed and we don't have these family albums anymore, you know, what are people going to do? So it's all sort of in that thread, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so that's how we just we determined that this would be the topic or the theme of the exhibition. And um, and Aline was right on, obviously, um, with just so many great images. Um, so I know that most of you know Aline, but I am going to introduce Aline. Um, for those of you that don't know her, I suggest you start uh, looking at her website, following her on Instagram um, and, and everywhere you can. Um, she is a Los, Los Angeles-based visual artist, editor, and educator. Her work has been exhibited in over 40 solo shows globally and featured in prestigious publications like the New York Times and the New Yorker. Smithson is the founder and editor in chief of Lens Scratch, a daily photography journal. She's received several awards, including the Rising Star and Excellence in Teaching Award, and her work has been selected for the Critical Mass Top 50. Smithson has published several monogram monographs and her work has been exhibited in prestigious institutions such as the National National Portrait Gallery in London. In addition to her artistic career, Smithson has also served extensively as a juror, reviewer, and educator in the worldwide photography community. Um, and although not yet sainted, I like to call her the patron saint of photography. Um, she's just such a wonderful person and amazing resource for 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 all of us um and we're also lucky to have her um as part of our community so with that um Aline, would you like to 
say a few words wow, about that. Amita. That was quite an intro. And I'm going to start drinking right now. <laughs> um, I have to give a shout out to Jonas Yip, who is in the chat, or at least he was a minute ago. Uh, he is the backbone of Lynn Scratch. And he has, uh, you know, you if you don't know, but for 17 years, we have all worked for free on that site. It's a give back to the community. And Jonas has been there since the beginning. And I am so grateful. Um, I wanted to start off by just talking about being a juror in general. And uh, it is a really, really subjective task. I just jurored uh, the Slow Exposures um, show with Alexa Dilworth. Two of us were jurors. We are very close friends. We like all the same photographs. And out of hundreds of photographs, we only had 32 in common. And then we had to fight with each other to get the rest of it. But we were both talking about how on a different day, we might pick different work. So what I want you to understand as artists is never to take things personally. Um, I get rejected all the time as an artist and I just move on. Like, it's just not, it's not, I don't think that the juror hates me. I just realize that there is so much good work being made and the juror is drawn to certain things. And uh, during this show was a, just a total treat for me because this is right in my wheelhouse. I loved everything. There were so many more images I wanted to include. But when I hit 90, I just said, there is nothing here I can get rid of. I love every single photograph in this show. And thank God Hamida said, all right, let's do it. Because this is a big show. And um, so I want to say bravo to everybody who submitted. And it's wonderful to see familiar faces. Um, but I'm going to take you, I want to share a little bit about uh, women, especially. I think there's 90% women in this show, and I didn't realize that till tonight. Have not really been able to make work about family until about the last 10 years. And in 2007, I noticed that there were a lot of dads making work about their families. And I thought this was a really interesting phenomenon. And I, and I wrote a, a number of uh, articles on Lynn Scratch about it. And one day I get an email from uh, the photographer, Judy Gellis, and I wanna share her work. Unfortunately, Judy passed away uh, two years ago, but she told me that no curator would look at her work. They had no interest in anything domestic, anything about family. And I think this, just go on her website and go through her work. It's so fantastic. And I'm gonna share a few of these cause they just, they're so hilarious. They're so real. Um, I would love to be able to go to the bathroom alone um, let me see, I have to click out of this. Now I'm just going to mute it, so I'm just the photographs. Uh, just mute. When Richard and I were first married, he told me I was to polish the bottoms of the pots and pans. I told him he was crazy, and if he wanted shiny bottoms, he could do it himself, so he did. Um, this is one of my favorites. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday afternoon, Jason is at nursery school and David naps. And I have one and one half hours free time to be creative and do important things. And I can so relate to this image. And I just think that this work is so powerful to me. It's the real, it's real life. And I think for a long time, women haven't really been, well, parents haven't been able to make work like that and have curators interested in it. And I think that that has radically shifted 
because if you look at the state of affairs today, so many curators are women. So many photo center directors are women. The only place that women do not show up is in book publishing. So anyone who's interested in another career, uh, maybe you should think about it. But I think that those are really important things for you to know about and think about is that you're, you're making work in a moment in time where you're able to get it out and have people appreciate it, where 10, 15 years ago, this might not have been the case. You would have been uh, probably rejected. So, uh, but again, I also want to stress that during something is, is really, really subjective and never to take it personally. Um, so, but I'm thrilled that you're all in the show. And uh, I just saw so many wonderful photographs. And the one thing that I thought about when I was looking at the hundreds of images was, does this photo tell me a story? This, this is really about storytelling. And if it was just a photo of a person, I didn't know the story behind that person. So a lot of the work really is a form of storytelling in this show. And um, that's another thing is to really, really think about what the show is about before you submit and um, think through the verbiage that this was about telling family stories. And uh, you all so beautifully did that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah, so so well said, Aline. So well said. Um, that was I love that you shared that work. That was fantastic. Um, so the first person, um, the first artist that will be speaking is um, Valerie Racine, um, who Aline selected at her as her jurors award. Um, Valerie, it's all yours. Uh, you're muted. My headphones on. Can you hear me there now? There you go. Yep, there you are. Okay, so hi. Hi, everyone. I just want to start by saying that I am <clears throat> honored to have, uh, to have my image part of uh, this exhibition. It's I'm kind of new to this, and I feel like I'm not a photographer. <laughs> I'm a fan, though. Um, I used to be a publisher of a photography magazine. And um, Aline, what you just said really moved me because uh, I think that, yeah, women should go into the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. I used to be there, not in book publishing, but in magazine publishing. And yeah, we should definitely be more out there. Um, and, and photography books are, uh, there's amazing work to share and um, more stories to be told. And so, yeah, I just want to say I am honored to have my image featured along with uh, uh, the other great work that I've seen. Um, about the series, I was just wondering what, I, what could I share? Because I'm, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that you had the actual background of the, um, of the story behind uh the image that uh, that was selected so i will just show maybe maybe uh the rest of the series so you can see okay hold on a second okay so can you see well the yes. screen is it okay okay yes. so um the... sorry before you get started um if you could Pull the image a little bit more to the center of your screen. Like that? A little the other way. Like that? A little uh, you had a little bit more. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Nice. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So uh so you see the uh the, the, the photography and the image is a tin type. So it's a series of tin type images that fell on my desk and that were uh, bought by a friend who wanted to work on a project. And he just wanted to say, hey, look at that. 
I thought that this would be interesting to you. So he just left the box on my desk in my studio. And I loved it so much, but I felt like, well, those are all abandoned objects. So, and they, they, they felt kind of sad. And um, so I just took it in my, I, I had one on my windowsill and I just looked at it from time to time. And I mostly work with collage and drawings and uh, things like that. And so one day I was like <laughs> tearing a bunch of uh, card box, uh, cardboard boxes I, from Ikea. And instead of um, sending it to, uh, to recycling, I was like, well, hey, maybe I could just do these little houses for those abandoned people. <laughs> And then I just had fun for a few weeks um, working on this. And then afterwards I was, I thought, well, since it's a series, how come, well, I almost have a village now. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't see the background well, um, but there is a print here, black on black, and it's a map. And the map is of a um, a community that was um, a utopian community that was created in um, the the town. The town was named uh, New Harmony in Indiana. I don't know if any of you heard about that. And so this is the so every one of those images have these in the background, and I just drew the rivers from the map with a pencil. And um, when I did this, I almost felt like I was, I don't know, I felt bad somehow because those people, I, I didn't know them and they were precious at one time. And I just created, re recreated families, but they were artificials. So, when I put them into this kind of artificial community that was named New Harmony, I felt like I was binding them together. It almost felt like a, felt like a kind of spell or something. And the thing is that New Harmony was a complete fail. So all of these images, um, they were created with these this kind of um, of not comfortable feeling unease somehow. So yeah. Um, what else could I say? Um, were these people from New Harmony? No, 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 no. It's a cre recreation of the story. No, I don't know who they are. They were just a box of abandoned tin types that fell on my desk. And this all also felt like, you know, the, the cardboard box, it, it felt like they were like a dead cat just waiting to be buried. There was something sad about that, about these people who I didn't know, but they used to be, you know, they existed. They used to be precious to, to someone. And um, yeah, so I played with them. Um, the cardboard because it's in you know it's a it's a cheap material it's something that you could just discard just like these tin types and uh, the background was uh printed in uh, with the risograph risography and um so you see there's one lurking behind the bushes here i just had fun there's one here too i don't know if you can see it there's someone here. Spying. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. They're really oh. wonderful. Oh, thank so, you so much. For me, I came out of the art world, not out of the photography world. And when I was in school, photography was part of the curriculum mm -hmm. 
in the art department. And when photography got separated out into its own thing, I think it lost a lot of creativity. It yeah, all became why, why about, that? Yeah. so yeah. I, I really, I, I see a trend also where we are, we are now artists who use photography. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that this is a really great example of that. Um, and to me, that's really exciting. Um, so that's one thing that I was really drawn to your creativity with this. Um, and again, really hard to pick one. Um, and then well, I also really, thought this show funny. would make an incredible book. So that could be your first book, Valerie. Oh, well, it would be amazing because I work, my studio is in, is in a place where uh, eventually we'll have all the equipment to do, you know, our, our artisanal, uh, no, what's the word? Uh, book binding, but um, small uh, publishing book binding. So uh, yeah, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I'll do that. It would be great. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, they are really wonderful and something I would love to see in person someday. Yeah, well, they're they're quite small. I wish I would have brought the, the, the actual frame. They, they have uh, this pass partout uh, all around it. And, and it felt like it's a box in a box in a box. You know, the tin type is in a box and then the frame is a box. And then there's, you know, so there's this idea of having something and something and something, which I love. <laughs> I think I'm pretty conceptual. When I, I just love to, you know, imagine stories and, yeah, and playing with that. And uh, I love that the the materials are also not precious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cardboard and yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And construction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Um, Nicole Carrere. Carrier. Carrier. <laughs> wow, I'm just messing it up today. Um, <laughs> You ready to share your work with us? Uh, so Nicole um, was my um, director selection. So please let us know more about your work. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll start with this. All right. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Carrier. I just want to start off first by Sincerely thanking the Center for Fine Art Photography, Hamida, Aline. Um, it's an incredible honor to be a part of this show. Um, I was blown away by the amount of work that was in here um, and how a lot of it also spoke to me. Um, I'd like to take my time today to kind of talk about a body of work that informed this um, and then also talk about this work specifically. So um, around 2014, 2015, I began a bottle of work entitled The Big Picture. This is an installation shot of um, the work when it was up in Cambridge. I grew up immersed in a visual language of family photographs, romantic comedies, and a sexualized culture, reflecting on my childhood and then place in my adult life, puzzled, intrigued, and questioning the person I continue to become, I began to analyze my own history of codes and symbols. In the big picture, I worked to dissect language, symbols, and performance of gender, relationships, from what I knew and what I'd, from what I had learned them to be. At that particular time, I was happening to look at a lot of installation art specifically. Um, I saw Mark Dion's octagon room at Mass Mocha in person. And it was the first time I had kind of experienced that kind of installation art and was beyond blown away. I felt privy to so much information, um, but if you've ever experienced any of um, Mark's work, you don't really know what to do with a lot of the information. Um, and so it was this like incredible 
entrance into something that you didn't really know what to do with. I started looking at other artists, um, specifically Tracy Emin and her installation, My Bed, and started also thinking about the personal and the personal within art. Both artists were challenging and changing the way I was thinking about sharing information through my art. Alongside with installation artist, I found myself continuing to revisit Catherine Opie's work. I saw her retrospective at the Guggenheim in New York City, my freshman year of college in 2008. Seeing her work was a pivotal moment for me in my artistic career in my life. Um, seeing queer representation that I felt myself echoed in on a wall in a museum was, I don't really have words for it other than pivotal. Um, her images continue to have a profound effect on how I think about vulnerability, strength, and all of its subtleties. I began to think about cork boards and how they function based on their setting. Their mode of sharing information and resources in a public setting, an organizational tool perhaps in an office setting, and a catch-all kind of altar for keepsakes and odds and ends in a private setting. While making Big Picture, I was in my early to mid 20s. And although for the most part I was out, I was very insecure about my own sexuality and learned behaviors of what I thought it meant to be female. I was trying to take what felt like an analytical approach to understanding what the big picture was for me and trying to understand my own discomfort within myself. I began using cork boards as a way to sort through my thoughts and sheer mass of personal keepsakes as a way to organize connections I was making, not only for me, but for the viewer as well. The cork board became a tool for combining the personal and informative with the concept as a cork board can be rearranged and these connections were fleeting, only pinned together through the photographic evidence of their existence. A lot of this body of work was also about visual and verbal language for me and finding safety and comfort in words that I hadn't used to identify as before, specifically queer. I wanted to make work that signified a kind of search and uncovering the feeling that I had felt and loved and admired within the installation art that I had experienced firsthand. Fast forward to the last four years, the pandemic gave me space to listen to the most inner parts of myself and find the most authentic version of myself as in fact non-binary. I started finding language for what felt like the spectrum of gender and I began to let myself recognize and change including my pronouns to include they. As I heard it more and more, I found euphoria that I hadn't experienced before. And I let myself follow the joy, hearing the word they in reference to me had in my whole being. I began a new body of work entitled Finding Them, in which I'm using to explore my gender identity. Big picture, which was the previous work we just looked at, I was focused on my identity through the lens of my family, my family album, and gendered culture I saw growing up. I was trying to approach that body of work from an outside looking in point of view. In this new body of work, finding them, I'm approaching it from an inside looking out. I'm more focused on learning and growing with my own gender identity, often struggling with visuals that represent what exactly that identity feels like in the current moment. Because of that, I find to be more drawn to images of nature currently as a way of expressing my growth and myself and my identity as it feels more natural now than it has before. I'd say I'm experiencing awe, wonder, and curiosity as I feel like I watch myself in anticipation to what it will become and the possibilities it holds. The out of context language I use is an attempt to point at something more concrete than maybe what the visuals portray, as there are times where I do struggle with the gray or in between, in between that I sometimes do feel. 
The language or phrases are usually ambiguous as my gender identity feels fluid in ways that are hard to join down, to pin down from day to day. The way I'm approaching this body of work is also less analytical than the way I was feeling I was approaching big picture, which has allowed me space to make collages in other places that feel less sterile than the cork, allowing for feelings of softness, contemplation, and sometimes confusion as the placement of the collages are in off or odd places. I made bedside notes, this image here, about the ability to name my gender. When I came to that kind of conclusion, it was this feeling of like, aha, I got it, <laughs> which was um, what I was thinking about with the fish, um, which was kind of something like I can hold it here, I've caught it, I got it. Um, but the moment is fleeting, similar to holding a fish. <laughs> um, the fish is directly also pointed towards this kind of dark, murky Polaroid of me. Um, as I was unclear about how naming my gender identity would do for me and how it was going to change me. I was also still continuing to think about uncovering and covering through how I folded and kind of cover up different parts of the image um, with layering. Um, the right side of the image is more representation, representative, <laughs> representative of the overwhelming feelings in general, some of joy and excitement, which the scribbles kind of allude to, and some of unease, which the drill, the looking eye kind of also points to. Perhaps an unconscious tribute to Tracy Emmons' bedside note, as the title alludes to was made on my own bed. A private made public space in which I've learned to hold space for all parts of myself. Again, I wanna thank the Center for Fine Art Photography and truly genuinely congratulate everyone in this show. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That was fantastic. Thank you. I just love bedside notes it really i mean i love the all of your work but that it really just even now when i saw it again it just brings it just you know hits home emotionally so thank you for that yeah and thank you for sort of taking us on the journey with you and showing us your art making and what inspired you it's really fascinating and thank you really appreciate that yeah, I felt really privileged to be able to do that. I really appreciate the space. Um, so the next person is um, Emily Buckley. Is Emily, I think I saw you join in. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Emily Buckley. I live in Denver, so it's fun to have a show closer to home even if it is virtual. But um, I also just wanted to echo what's been said earlier. I, I found the show to be completely breathtaking and I am so um, honored to be among um, all of the artists showing and so grateful um, to be here. I am going to show um, a few pictures from a series that I'm working on for the last three years and which um, one of the, the photo chosen for the show is from. Um, I think you can see, right? Okay. Yes. Um, I started working on this project, which I um, call Enduring Love, um, a little over three years ago, or about three years ago when I was pregnant with my second daughter and I already had my first daughter. And my goal was to, to convey in, in photographs how motherhood was a transformative process for me, how I... Um, was shedding an old identity and um, and assuming a new one, which um, was a kind of an amazing but also a chaotic process. And when I was pregnant, I was picturing what the photos of these two girls would look like together. And because I think as photographers, we're always like th thinking about the next picture, so I had a certain view of what that 
was going to look like. And when my second daughter, Rosie, was born, she started having seizures um, immediately after birth. And the she was sent to the NICU and spent a month in the NICU. And through genetic testing, which is just really available now and as in this rapid way, we learned that she has a typo in her genetic makeup or a, a de novo variation in one of her genes that is brand new to her. It impacts every aspect of her life. She, um, at two and a half, um, she has a couple words. She doesn't um, talk really though. She doesn't walk. Um, she has constant seizures. And um, this really changed what my family album looks like. And I at first felt, well, I can't make another picture ever. I just felt that I couldn't. And um, then I was filled with a, a feeling that I absolutely had to, that nothing was more important than, than making this, this work in my life. Um, and I also, I, that was so um, great, Nicole, that you talked about your influences. One of my influences was reading around the time that Rosie was born, an interview with um, Cheryl St. Ange where she talked about dealing with her mother's uh, Alzheimer's and feeling as if she couldn't continue and then realizing that art was the way, was the way through. So that, that was really, um, really compelling to me. So this body of work is about, it's still about motherhood. It's still about these two girls. It's still about um, our life and, and what is hard and what is puzzling and what is beautiful. Um, and I am just taking pictures of what, what I see right now, what I want to convey to others about, about this experience. And um, I'll just show the rest of it. And so this is Rosie getting an EEG, which measure, measures her brain waves. It can detect seizures or irregular patterns in brain waves, um, which of course she does have. But this is what my what my, my family album looks like um, these days. Um, and it's it's full of a lot of a lot of love, a lot of hope, a lot of terror. Um, but that's what it is. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to share this this work and my experience as well. Emily, what drew me to select that particular image was your thumb. Yeah. And I really thought about motherhood and trying to hold on to two at once and the complexity of that. And that for me, it was a really powerful image. Um, so I just wanted to share that that was why I, cause I just felt like the thumb really was the anchor in some ways for that photograph. I know that sounds weird, but. No, it doesn't sound weird to me. <laughs> um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm so glad you decided to continue making images. It's really powerful, um, really powerful and really beautiful images. Um, I love the one of, um, of your younger daughter. I think we talked about this when we had a review. Um, in the in the um, brush and yeah. the, the flowers, it's just so, just so emotional. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really lovely, thank you. Um, the next person is Anahit Cass. Yes. Hello. Hello. Why can I share my screen for me? Yes, please. Mm. Okay, here it is. Great. Um, hello everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much, Hamida Elaine, the Center for Fine Art Photography, for choosing this image um, for our director's honorable mention. I'm on a heat cast and um Photography is one of the primary interests of my art practice that examines complex questions of identity, community, healing, hope, prompting consideration of the underlying 
issues of social justice and human rights. This portrait, Tati Gif Bapik, or Grandma and Grandpa, is from my ancestors' series of heritage portraits that are based on vintage family photographs. Ancestors is part of a much larger project about Swana, Southwest African and uh, Southwest Asian and North African futurism, and how we connect to our ancestors is part of the future we imagine. These portraits connect our personal histories to heritage sites and cultural artifacts in a way that denies the politics of imperialism. Tati Kiev Papik is set in occupied Artsakh, which is indigenous Armenian land in the South Caucasus. The portraits interrogate and resist the dominant historical narratives written by colonialist empires about the people they've displaced and creatively reimagine them. This project has been among the most joyous work I've ever done. Ancestors was especially beautiful because the subjects felt such a deep emotional connection to their loved ones through the portraits. When asked why they wanted to collaborate on an ancestor portrait, so many of the people that I photographed explored questions of identity, belonging, and the loss of homeland. Tatik Yevpapik is a portrait of actor and activist Karani Rose Mekartichian going beyond the gender binary and embodying her great grandparents. And this is what she said about her experience. When I received the photos this morning, I cried for a long time. My grandpa Pik Karakin passed before I was born, but I carry his story of survival with me every day. From losing his entire family in the Armenian genocide, to his time in an orphanage in Jerusalem before settling in Armenia. My great grandmother and I were incredibly close and I miss her every day. This morning, I finally had a moment to breathe and cry and remember all that she gave me, the laughter and her unconditional love. It's her love, kindness and open heart that truly embodies the Armenian soul. To share a little bit about my process, I began with my own family photographs, which are part of the series, moved on to friends, and then reached out on social media to find people interested in collaborating to share their own family stories. The portraits were shot in my studio, where I spent a lot of time chatting with the subjects to get to know them, talk to them about their ideas for the future and their motivations for working with me. We reviewed the shots together, choosing the ones we agreed to become the final portraits. The backgrounds are also my photographs, often digitally collaged to represent things important to the sitter. Karani's portraits were made in my traveling studio since I photographed people all across the country for the series. And the backgrounds of these particular photographs were minimally altered due to our desire to represent our connection to our indigenous lands and the beauty of the land before the occupation. Let me go on to the next one. Karani, as her great grandmother, is set in a lovely place that I've picnicked many times before the invasion and occupation. The uniquely beautiful waterfalls have been beloved as restful and sacred places for millennia. As her great grandfather, Karani's portrait is set in an opening to the canyon of Jidrduz. It's a place where our people have lived, grazed their flocks harvested the wild fruits and berries, buried our dead, and carved the stone into beautiful works of art for millennia. Karani's great-grandparents had a really charming love story that continued throughout their lives. And so we worked from their favorite photos of each other. And she's holding one here in the portrait of her great-grandfather. They, um, Her great-grandfather was new to America and he saw her on the street walking with her brother. and. I guess it was love at first sight. So he went up and asked if he could speak to her. And from that flowed a lifetime of love and connection and family. And I just love that story. Um, in addition to photography, I also work in video sculpture and other mediums. My work merges ancestral traditions with futurist visions, grounding my artistic expression, in historical motifs, objects, rituals, and sacred places. Collaborative projects play an important role in my practice in creating shared visions and narratives. And I hope that for you, the viewer, my work also paints a hopeful picture of a future built on 
interconnectedness and mutual support. And yeah, there, there are 20 portraits in this series so far. Um, many of them like Karenis have the photographs of their families and the stories are all quite wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciated being part of this show and really enjoyed so far hearing all the other artists talk and the work is so wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, just such incredible work, such incredible stories. Um, I, you know, bef I would love to, if, if, you know, for people to go visit the artists' websites that are in the show. So you can see um, there's so many artists in the show that have incredible bodies of work of which the image that's in the show is, is, is one one image. So I encourage you to visit people's websites. Um, thank you, Anahit. That was beautiful. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the photographs just hint at the story, but then to hear the artist speak about it is just fantastic. Like really deep thinking behind all of the work. Thank you. Um, Diane. Durant. Hi. Hopefully my cats. Okay, one of them just jumped out of the planter. The other one came. Um, you are frozen. Was she referring to a child or a cat? A cat. <laughs> <laughs> Think we've lost Diane at least for the, for the yeah. Maybe go um, on to the next person. Sure, we'll come back to you, Diane. Um, Ruth, Ruth uh, Keats. Are you there, Ruth? She's there. She's still getting unmuted. Oh, okay. I couldn't see her. We need. We need Ruth. You still need to unmute yourself. Oh, here, I can do that. Hold on. Hamid is going to do it. I think. I am. I just, it, uh, oh, it says ask to unmute. So. There we go. There's. The last name's pronounced kites, like the things that fly in the sky. Kites. kites. Thank you for correcting me. That's okay. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, can you pull up my piece, Betsy? Thank you for helping, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just a minute. Here we go, share screen. Okay. You'd never know this was my computer, would you? <laughs> well, with this particular piece that was uh, included in the exhibition, and I, I, I was just overwhelmed that um, this was selected. And so as with the other artists, I'm very grateful to have been included in such a prestigious exhibition with such a prestigious juror having done the selections. I would say that this is probably the the third series that I have done with photographs. The first one did start with family photographs at the turn of the 21st century, where I would scan them and manipulate them in different ways and put them into collages. And then the second series grew out of a box of photographs and letters and tin types that I purchased at a secondhand store. And I couldn't believe anybody had actually sold these very personal items. And I did a series of collages from those and incorporated the photographs and the letters into the um, representations. With this third one, it's based on a series of photographs that I took when I was had my last visit with a friend who has since passed away. And these are photographs that were taken at Seal Rock, Oregon, where we spent several days. Um, 
I'm born under the sign of cancer and uh, ruled by the moon and the tides of the ocean. So I have a special affinity for water. Even though I can't swim, I really enjoy the uh, water. And so with these photographs, I went through and selected various ones that I wanted to use uh, to recall those last days that we had together. And I've incorporated, as I've done in other collages, the window envelope, which becomes the representation of a door or a window or something that looks into the past remembrances. And with the uh, others have talked about how these are presented. This is presented in a shadow box because of the three dimensional quality of the envelope where I tore this particular envelope open. And so there's that torn part on the lower right hand corner of the envelope. It's um, the piece is 14 inches high, 11 inches wide. These are uh, photographs that I took with just the um, camera on my phone, not very sophisticated, but the uh, images captured that very particular feel of the Pacific Ocean, the vastness of it, the rocks. I'm down here in far south Texas, about a half hour from the Mexico border, about a half hour from South Padre Island. And the coast is very different here. It's just flat and sandy, like the rest of the landscape. And so I especially enjoyed the Pacific Northwest coast with these rocks that were there. Because the, um, I didn't want the photograph, just the photograph by itself, uh, I incorporated other materials. So the green there in the lower right-hand corner is mat board. The light beige is an extension of the sand, it's sandpaper. And then uh, on either side, that's just the painted uh, canvas panel that I used to create this piece. I would say that this, um, this series is ongoing. I didn't really start on the pieces until after she had passed away. So it was a kind of remembrance and at the same time, the way to deal with that uh, loss. I have another piece that uh, I've been working on. It's uh, very different from this one. It's going to be four feet high by three feet wide. And it, but it also includes the ocean views within it. So these, this particular piece allows me to kind of bring things to closure. This is something that's not going to happen again but I can travel back there anytime I want to. So thank you very much for having included me in this exhibition. I couldn't be more pleased to be with such a wonderful group of artists. Thank you. I have to say, Ruth, when I saw this piece, my first reaction was, damn, why didn't I think of that? Like <laughs> that is such a brilliant, I mean, it was just like, oh my God, this is brilliant. So bravo to you on that. And this also speaks to art and photography mixed. Um, and uh, it's just such a great piece. And it, you know, the envelope really works as a frame, but it also speaks to memory and uh, correspondence and all of that. So really well done. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Are you, if you can stop, there you go, perfect. Thank you. And then um, the last artist is Carol Mills Naronha. Are you with us, Carol? She's here. I'm mute. Hi, hello. So I'm Carol. Um, I'm Australian, <laughs> so I live in Mal Melbourne, Australia. Um, and so I did a series, I will try and share my screen. I had to get my son in just to get my camera working. So mm -hmm. I will see if I can do it. Uh, this screen here. 
Oh, not. Sorry. Yay. Perfect. Oh, can you see it? Oh, yes. yes. Can you see my pictures? Okay, because I've got two screens happening and I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so this is a photo I did, family heirlooms, um, I called it. It's of my family home in Melbourne. Um, so it's the only home I ever knew. So I was born in 1970 and lived there all my life. My parents were there. And so what was happening with my father, my mum had passed away. So this series was uh, 2019. So my sister and I were visiting my dad daily. We noticed a lot of changes with my dad. Um, he was forgetting so many things and just not himself. And we knew a long time before he was officially diagnosed that his mind was changing and so he was eventually diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's. So when I'd go and visit my dad every day, we would get out, like I've just always loved photos and old photos of family and I'm very much into, you know, very sentimental and into my family. And so this is my beautiful grandmother who taught me so much and my mum and my sister and I in the 1970s paddling pool. So what I did was with on my visits with dad, because I noticed he was losing touch with what was happening, but he was remembering the past. So I would get all the old photo family albums out and basically just we would go through them every time I'd go over. So always looking at the photos and so I thought, well, Dad's declining. You know, he was in his late 80s and I just had this feeling, a gut feeling that things were changing rapidly with Dad and this house is not going to be forever. So I wanted to record the house. So I had my old uh, pictures, the photos, and I basically use the old original 70s photos, that's myself there, um, and held them up in the same locations because the house hadn't really changed much um, in all those years. So, so I just started this series. There's my dad sitting there. You can see all this. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. And that's myself with Humphrey, my favourite bear. Um, so I just wanted to record it. So it was sort of 40 something years onwards. So recording the house, recording my life there. Um, so my sister and I uh, in the old photo there, my niece who is with a photo of my mother, that's where my mother passed away. Um, she had a stroke and she passed suddenly. So just before my niece was born. So Maddie, my niece, never got to meet her grandmother. Um, so that was just to record, you know, mum's passing and being a family home. We had all the pets that had passed away were all buried in the backyard and so many, so many memories in that house. Um, so I, that's why I started this series, um, which I'm so glad I did because not long after this series, Dad had um, a huge seizure and ended up in hospital for a month, which was where he was then diagnosed with, officially with dementia and Alzheimer's, and he never returned to the house. He had to go from there into full-time care. So, and since then to afford full-time care, the house was sold and the house is no longer ours. Having said that, these photos, um, Dad, when he, as his dementia progressed, I then moved from this series, Family Heirlooms, to documenting Dad's life with dementia and Alzheimer's. The more he forgot, the more I photographed to show Dad um, his life. And the photographs, that's what I love about photos. The house is gone. The Everything is gone with the house. My mum is gone, my grandmother. 
my dad has recently passed away as well. Um, but all that remains are the photos. And that's what is so important to me is photographing, documenting while you can and just, just doing it, just following my gut and just saying, okay, this is what I need to do. Um, and that's the last series of my sister and her now daughter um, in a party in the 1970s. So, um, so that's my series, uh, Family Heirlooms. Um, yeah, and so that's just, that was all 2019 and wrapped up and yeah, that's it. But I want to thank you for the opportunity, um, you know, for this amazing exhibition. And when I saw all the, the exhibition online, I just thought, oh, I found my people. Like, I just felt like this is where I fit in. And I just, it was so inspiring seeing everybody's work. And yes, I'm very honored. And, and I thank you so much for the opportunity. And, and it's great listening to other people and everyone's just so talented. So thank you. And I'll try now to um, share my screen if I can do that. I think I need to go back to this one. Bear with me. Uh, two, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm hopeless at this stuff. Oh, you did a pretty good job for. for oh, thank for you. Not feeling I'm like just, you know what you're doing. Um, you I have absolutely no, way, down, no if you, idea. If you get so, back to the Zoom screen. Um, uh, Let's see, how do I do that? I'm trying to just make it big again. Can you do it, Hamida? I know. I, um, Maybe if I don't see. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Ah, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know I had that <laughs> kind of power, but I learned. <laughs> Thank you. I really wish everyone could talk about their work because it just is so in, we've learned so much from everyone tonight. And, um, you know, I completely agree uh, about finding your people. Uh, this, there's just, you know, I, I've talked about this in some lectures, but one thing that really struck me during the pandemic was the importance of telling our stories. And I think the pandemic gave us time for some people to go through family albums and go through archives. And I started writing down stories about my life that I want my kids to know. Because if I don't write them down and I don't put them into a form that can be shared, they're just going to disappear when I disappear. So I think, uh, Carol, what you've done is such a wonderful way to record your family history and then to have your niece and the next generation have something really concrete to look back on. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. <clears throat> really wonderful. Thank you. So, so that's, um, is, there, is there anyone else here that, um, that joined us that was supposed to speak tonight? I was able to get back. Oh, there you are, Diane. Thank you. I'm so glad. Yes. Perfect. My apologies. My cats are awful and I, they hate when I'm on my computer, but this time they decided to just take it out at the router. <laughs> like as soon as I said it, they just jumped right down on the power strip button. Um, so my apologies for that. But yeah, if I could talk for a few minutes, I'd love to. Yes, please. Okay. Now, let's see. Let me pull up. Well, of course, it's not going to. There we go. Okay. Um, 
so this is just a page for my website that has this portfolio on it. Um, this series of images is uh, turned into a book that came out in January of 2020. So I didn't really get to uh, promote it or talk about the work. So it's taken a lot in a way kind of discipline for me to not move on from it, but to go ahead and stay with the work, talk about the work, um, continue to process it, you know, personally. Um, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about it and to keep keep showing this work. Um, so stories 1986 to 88 comes from a time frame in my life growing up as a, a little tomboy queer kid in small town Texas. Um, and if anyone would ask me about like traumatic events or life-changing events that could have happened in my life, I always frame it, whether it's accurate or not, from 1986 to 88. And I know there are outliers, but everything in my memory just goes right back to that time period. So when my, and that's when I was eight, nine, and 10. And when my daughter turned eight, she began to look even more like me. And although she has her own uh, personality for sure, she started to take on even more of my physical characteristics. And I started to see myself in her. So rather than photographing my daughter, I started photographing my daughter as the character of me. And together, instead of us you know, revisiting the family album, we just remade it. So I went back kind of therapeutically. So I even had uh, my therapist wrote the forward to my book. Um, although she doesn't say she's my therapist, but um, she was. Um, so as I was going through talking about this time period in my life and why it's just the repository for all of my bad memories, we started talking about this photo project. And so I started photographing Andy, my daughter, as me, and we just redid what I wanted my memories to look like. So the images are paired with text. And I, this is the image that was, uh, is in the show. Um, I turned my handwriting into a font it, reminiscent of when you would write notes on, you know, photographs from the back of photographs. But I started, let's see if I can see this. I started, um, there we go. Photographing her, this is actually based on a, a real photograph my mother took. I prefer uh, parallel and perpendicular lines, especially to the picture plane. But my mother, not a trained, you know, photographer by any means, wanted instead to show all of the uh, plants in her garden. So she's shooting on the diagonal. So I forced myself to remake this actual photo uh, on the diagonal. Of course, in the original photo, I have put on that smile. I smiled in, in all my photos or made goofy faces. But for my daughter, even though she kind of preferred this anyway, this kind of deadpan stance that she would take, um, it really allowed me to project onto her. Uh, and she wasn't, you know, claiming any of that as her own. So it was, it was very fun for us. She would get into, into position and be laughing and having fun. And then she would just hit the pose and become me in my actual clothes that my mom had kept, um, you know, for 30 years. So the text on this one says there wasn't a functioning in a dysfunctional family badge, or I would have earned that one too. And all of the texts have this kind of like tongue in cheek narrative that goes with them, this juxtaposition. Um, and mostly I'm kind of reclaiming my childhood for myself and, and being able to experience that with my daughter. We've now built a whole new set of memories. And so the kind of layers of that are probably more than I even at this point can can fully uh, appreciate. Uh, this one says, my grandfather taught me how to fish with a string and a paper clip. Life was going to teach me that it wouldn't always be so simple. And she's wearing my uh, t-shirt from Girl Scout camp. This, when I was for my eighth birthday, I had a hobo themed birthday party. I don't know why my parents said yes to that, but I liked tramp clowns, which is really what it was. 
And um, so everyone came dressed like a tramp clown. Um, and this one says, the closest I ever came to the transient life of my dreams was a hobo themed birthday party. Come as you are, the invitation said, which was all I needed to hear. And the invitations were printed on paper bags. Again, I wanted to be a clown. I wanted to be a clown so bad. My parents would not let me be a clown. So I made let my daughter be a clown. Um, are you going to run away and join the circus? They would kid, but clown college was no joke. Um, I was, I played baseball. Like I said, I was that little tomboy um, that I love so much about myself, but it really was about me trying to reclaim my identity in the looking back. So this is the last one I'll show you. Um, she's wearing my brother's football uniform. Again, my mom didn't throw anything away, speaking of archives. And our relationship is incredibly fractured, um, incredibly so. And she just dumped four boxes of stuff on my porch one afternoon and didn't say anything to me, left. And it was just all of these wonderful relics from our family. This one says, if I could rewrite the little ditty about Jack and Diane, I'd be the football star. So thank you so much for letting me hop in here. And um, I, again, this show is beautiful and it's an absolute honor to be a part of it. So thank you for that too. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. Cause there, the world needs more humor and it's, but it's humor that has pathos too. Um, but yeah, I salute you for finding the humor in those moments. Oh, thank you. Well, it definitely made the healing process not easier, but I think I got there because I was able to kind of reclaim it, but do it in a way that, yeah, kind of ended up laughing at the situation. So, which and a lot of these images did too. I loved it. Well, and I was a Girl Scout, so that really <laughs> resonated with me. But yeah, uh, how do we buy your book? Um, I you can go to my website, dianedurant.com, and there's a link to purchase. Um, and it'll you'll purchase it from me, which means I make money off of that instead of not that you can't buy it from daylight. Love those guys. Um, but yeah, and I'll sign it and put it in the mail to you. Okay. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Wonderful. Those, yeah, those are great images. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a, a little bit of time left. Um, if there's any comments, uh, other feedback, um, Aline, any sort of overall thoughts after hearing more about the work? Well, I'd love to just hear from some of the other artists, just, uh, you know, I'm going to, ca I'll call on people. Okay, good. <laughs> and you can say whatever you want. So I'm going to go right in for Susan Coffer Carey. Uh, just about the idea of making work about family and telling your stories. And so Susan, you have any thoughts on that? You had a beautiful piece in the show. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I really, first of all, the, the work that everybody showed today was so beautiful and moving in so many directions. And I do feel like art is really the place we heal ourselves. Um, I, I heard a really amazing quote the other day that said, artists process their lived experience in public so others can process their lived experience in private. Art is always an act of service. And the image for me that was in the show really started as a, um, you had done a call, Aline, a couple in 21 for an alternative process, something. And I was about to go in the middle of the pandemic to the East Coast to watch my daughter, to my daughter's graduation. So I knew I wasn't going to really be in a working space, but I grabbed just a handful of old family photos that I had copied and I grabbed some thread. And I just went on the plane. I figured I'll make something. And by the time I got to New York, um, I found out that my mother was going to have to be put into hospice and was dying. And it, it, I mean, it's still very raw for me. And so I would just stay up until all hours of the night weaving, you know, sewing on these photographs. And it started a series I have called She's In Me because I, I noticed that I have my mother's body exactly. And as I was in her apartment in New York, I noticed that 
I, I was becoming her, you know, really physically becoming her. And as I started telling these stories more, weaving pictures with my grandmother and it just became so powerful and poignant to, um, to tell a new story, to take something very old, like this, this family photograph, and then create a new narrative with a new um, technique. And the one that's in the show is actually my father. Um, so I'm kind of expanding the series because it's not just about my mother and my grandmother, but it's, it's the family that comes through us. And um, that it, he was born on the 4th of July. And so I was just sort of playing with very primary colors, red, white, and blue, which I had never really done. And he had those gorgeous, you know, those old portraits where people's eyes just come through. He had light eyes and they were just incredible. And I, I just find that when I spend time with my family in these images with the slow meditative process of embroidering, which I only learned to do for this. I, my daughter said, mom, how do you not embroider? I just found that it, um, it kind of wove a new story. It helped me understand their story. And it really, at the expense of being sort of stereotypical, it, it kind of wove us together. And I saw my similarities. I saw our my connection with my ancestors. It was just beautiful. And I, I love you for creating such ongoing platforms where, I love what you said earlier, where photography is really a paintbrush if we're telling us, it's just one tool that we're using. And um, thank you for just showcasing all these unique ways of, of telling these narratives using photography and, and other mediums. Yeah, it's, this is a beautiful show. Thank you for including me in it. You are so welcome. Um, I'm going to call on Chile, Wisconsin, Eric Nelson. Do you have any comments, Eric? Well, I, I just typed something because I didn't want to interrupt anyone speaking. I, I'm Thank you, artists and organizers. This presentation has been a real treat. Um, I live in a part of the country where we don't have uh, anything to this degree, and it's it's wonderful to know that there's this type of dialogue going on that furthers personal stories out in public like this. It's very, it's very moving for me. I, I appreciate all of you and the curation has been wonderful to bring us all together. So thank you very much. Okay, I have to see, seek out a new victim. Um, <laughs> Teresa Tahara, you wrote something in the chat. I'd love for you to expound on that. If she's there. Nope. She might have gone to dinner. Um, I'm here. Okay, do you want to share, you wanna talk a little bit? Oh, hi, Eileen. Um, uh, the work is all beautiful. Um, I um, really was drawn to this competition because I just, you know, I have a, I had a lot of ideas, but there was, there's one huge elephant in my mind and in my, my mind's room was watching my mother pass away uh, from Alzheimer's and listening to the stories today was really endearing because I don't feel alone. And I feel like I'm, I, people are going to walk through this through this in their lives watching their parents and loved ones and so it, it helped me to see everybody's work and hear the stories the hardships because there's a lot of pain in families uh, but there's also a lot of love um and uh i just am really happy to to see um people's stories because they're so important you're so important to how we live our lives and how we function and how we move forward um and um, i'm always drawn to uh aileen and your work and uh the found objects and even family photos that aren't even mine i like to imagine me living with those people <laughs> and that's another project but Thank you for calling on me. I really appreciate it. And, you know, this is all about um, 
living with what we are given in this life and uh, moving on and making the best of it. And instead of focusing on the negative, because the negative has to be there for us to understand and love the positive. <laughs> That's all I can say. So, you know, I think for a long time, artists were afraid to tell their personal stories and reveal parts of themselves. And I really noticed it with Phil Toledano's project, Days with My Father. Oh, um, yes. It was really one of the first series that was successful about talking about having a parent with dementia. And he started a Tumblr. He, I heard him talk about it, I think maybe at the center. Um, and uh, he said, I never thought I would put this out in the world. I was just making this work for myself. And he started a Tumblr and he started receiving thousands of emails from people struggling in the sandwich generation, caring for elderly parents. No one had put a visual face to that experience. And he was really one of the first artists to do that. And it was so powerful. I mean, that series still really stays with me. And Ever since then, I felt like he opened the door for us to tell our stories. And, and I think the more that we are vulnerable and reveal ourselves, uh, the more human we are and people respond to it. I think they're not, people are not judging it. They're, because we all are experiencing, you know, the yin and yang of life. So, um, you know, I really think it's fantastic when, Diane can share all of these fabulous moments when she was eight or nine that she remembers. You know, these this just it 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 shared humanity. And absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for this yeah. competition and and the wisdom that it it portrays in in living. So yeah. thanks. Amy. Thank you, and Curtis. Anna, I'm going to call on you last because you're you're one of the younger folks in this Zoom. Uh, Hannah Latham, uh, really, really beautiful series of your grandparents, and um, I'm so glad that you've documented them and their life. Um, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I've been documenting my grandparents and their decline um, over the past couple of years. Um, as I graduated from RISD in Providence, I lived down the road from them. Um, and yeah, it, it gets, gets me a little emotional sometimes. Um, you know, I think it's a way to cope. Um, it's a way to document and save uh, for future generations. Um, and to try and reach out to other people who are experiencing a uh, loss in their family. Um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's uh, as well. So I do relate to some of the other folks who've talked about that. Um, that's been especially difficult with the caregiving side of things. Um, and so now uh, since they've both passed, I'm documenting the aftermath. Um, so my image in this uh, show um, is a photograph of my cousin um, holding my aunt um, as my grandfather, who was in the casket behind them, um, you know, lays to rest. And I'm just so grateful to be part of this exhibition. Um, I think it's really important that we're talking about these things. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, back to you, Hamida. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so moved by all these amazing stories and images um, that are so emotional um, and that are so honest. It's really, um, I, feel, I feel really honored to, to have all of this work um, on our website and to be celebrating everyone. So thank you all for, for, for being a part of, of, of this. Um, and thank you, Aileen, for um, working with me and for you know making this 
exhibition what it is um, and for asking for more images. <laughs> you can always ask, right? You never know what, what the what the I have is. never juried anything where I haven't begged the person that the, you know, can I have five more, 10 more? <laughs> um, but someone in this group has got to be a graphic designer and could produce a beautiful, even paperback book of this show. So yeah, if, if you are out there. To me. Um, yeah. So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you all being here tonight. Again, um, if uh, it, once uh, we save uh, the recording and we will make it available on our YouTube channel, um, we'll send that out to everybody. Um, please um, look at our website. We have a lot of um, artist talks coming up and workshops and other things. So I encourage you to, to look at what we have uh, going on. And um, again, thank you all for being here tonight. It's really been lovely, really moving. So bravo to everyone. Thank you and good night. How do I stop recording? Oh, there we go.